Welcome to Mining Now. We are on day two at the PDAC. I'm filming here from Vancouver, your host, Jared Downey. And we are featuring different companies that are attending the PDAC in Toronto. And it's the first day we did four episodes, very wide range um, from manufacturing to software. Um, we're going to be featuring actual uh, junior mining companies. But today we are uh, featuring one of our first guests. This is a circle around. They've been on the show a couple of times, but this is now the third time on the show. But it's going to be a different guest. Andrew Palangio, the senior technical specialist at Whipware, is going to be on. Um, I've got to give a quick out to uh, Tom Palangio uh, Sr. and Th Thomas Palangio, who've been big supporters of our show uh, from the beginning. Andrew, welcome to the show. Great to have you on. Thanks for having me. Happy to be here. Yeah. Uh, how's PDAC? So you're one day in and uh, day two started. How's it going so far? It's uh, busier. It's picking up. We uh, had a, a interesting start yesterday. There's been so many people here. They actually had to roll in security to try and uh, corral corral people and uh, not wow. overload the spaces. So that's a good thing. That's a it's a not not pleasant when you're stuck in a line, but it's a good thing. Well, so. people are hungry to get out, and you know we had like right. CIM in Vancouver, which got a great turnout. But of course, mm -hmm. a lot of people from back east still weren't able to make it out. So now this is sort of their chance to go to the their big mining event uh, out east. Absolutely. There's a hundred different uh, companies just like ourselves from Northern Ontario who are all uh, here just in one small section of a much larger uh, trade show. So it's it's been really cool to be here among friends, seeing people again and uh, getting an, another great opportunity to display our technology and then meet new uh, meet new opportunities. Yeah, yeah well, um, let's, uh, I, I guess let's jump right into it. Can you go sure. give, give a snapshot of Whipware? Um, sort of the uh, the manufacturing, the designing, sort of just that that overview uh, for anybody who doesn't know, and then we'll jump into some of the specifics. Sure, yeah. So um, based up in North Bay, Ontario, uh, wonderful place to live and do business in. And we have uh, been at this since uh, the mid 80s. Um, of course, staying on top of all the latest technology throughout. Uh, started with DOS, <laughs> if anyone remembers what DOS was like. Uh, now we're on uh, all platforms, uh, iOS, Android, and uh, and Windows, of course. We do size, shape, volume, and color analysis of material, whether that's on a conveyor belt, whether it's being dumped out of the back of a truck, whether it's uh, uh, in the pit, uh, underground, above ground, doesn't matter where. Um, take pictures of material and analyze them to find out what you're like I said, size, shape, volume, and color distribution. Uh, if you're looking for contamination, if you're looking for something that doesn't belong or something that should be there in your in your process or in your material, that's what we help you with. That's the 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 Coles Notes version. Yeah, um, let's go into because we've you you said just before we came on air that that Whipfrag is sort of everything is built around that. Um, yeah, absolutely. So can you sort of give us that foundation then? Yeah, sure. So Whipfrag is the software. It's what started it all. Um, and that's, it's, uh, like I said, multi-platform, that's where you import images or take pictures on site and do, uh, within a, uh, a second, you basically get a full set of size, shape, volume, and color, uh, distribution of your material. So whether your size, the size of your materials on spec, whether the shape is correct, uh, if the particles aren't the right shape, if the rocks aren't the right shape, it's going to cause problems downstream in your process. So you want to identify that early. Uh, the volume of material that's passing by a certain location or that you've that you've uh, blasted. And of course, uh, the, the color, uh, which everyone's kind of interested about that color. What does color mean? Well, uh, it's something as simple as limestone. Uh, you don't want to have anything that's not limestone in there. Limestone's an easy thing to pick out. It's bright white, in most cases, grayish color. Um, but there could be coal or slate or something else mixed in there. You want to look out for contamination like that. And actually a really interesting application is uh, I've, we've done some work with uh, shingles. So the little uh, stones that uh, color the shingles on the roof of your home, mm -hmm. uh, people want to have a, the right mix of black and blue and brown and to make all these different patterns. That's the kind of thing that uh, you want to know that you have the right percentage of each color uh, material passing by. That's the kind of thing that, uh, that the software can do. So the software, like I said, is what started it all. It's um, been on the market for a long time, uh, always, uh, 
always leveraging the latest technology. Uh, and now that everyone has uh, phones in their pockets and tablets uh, available to them, it makes it really easy to empower you with this, this handheld tool that uh, gives you this information so quickly. Um, the, the, the software, uh, the systems we, we build just leverage that software and basically automate the process by controlling the, the different variables, the lighting, the angle, and that kind of thing. Okay, so let's take a moment to thank our sponsors. And first up, we have Petro-Canada Lubricants. HF Sinclair, which includes the Petro-Canada Lubricants brand, is a proud sponsor of Mining Now. Petrocanal Lubricants products and services are proven to maximize equipment performance, productivity, and overall savings. From heavy-duty engine oils to hydraulic fluids, ATFs, gears oil, gear oils, and greases, Petrocanal Lubricants is committed to delivering innovative solutions that deliver value and keep businesses moving. They have dedicated technical expertise, knowledge, and know-how to help customers in the mining industry operate smoothly with improved equipment, reliability, and performance. Learn more at lubricants.petro-canada.com or contact them at 1-866-335-3369 to arrange a call with one of their technical experts. We also have DICORP. In business since 1960, DICORP is a leading private manufacturer and distributor of specialty chemicals, equipment, parts, and accessories serving the energy and mining industries. DICORP manufactures and distributes a full line of drillers, edge coring raw, drillers, edge coring rods, core retrieval systems, and diamond tooling for diamond core drilling worldwide. They also manufacture and sell high quality earth pro drilling fluids and additives for the mineral exploration and energy industries. For more, please visit them at die-corp.com or contact them at 780-440-4923. Last but not least, we've got Savin Equipment. Savin Equipment supplies new and used mining equipment around the world from plaster to underground to ore processing plants. They have gold concentrating tables, trauma rolls, and mineral jigs in stock now to take advantage of the high gold prices. You can visit them at SavinEquipment.com where you will find more equipment every day. And now back to the interview. From, from knowing, uh, you know, both Tom's and getting to know you, that the Whipper really has, a, you know, a, a, a Every company will say that they do, but Whipware has a very collaborative approach. I mean, we've had, you, you've sent us guests, your company has sent us guests. I mean, we, and, but just the partnerships you've developed over the years. So I was curious, I was seeing the, it's a solo conveyor and analysis system. And I was going to ask about that. Is that a proprietary internal thing or is that a partnership uh, product line that you're carrying? Uh, no, that's uh, that's a proprietary internal thing. So we um, we do manu- Now that being said, uh, we don't build all the components ourselves. Right. We yeah, do. Uh, we have technology uh, that we're using. We try to use as much Canadian homegrown stuff as we can. Uh, can't win in all departments, but uh, all of our manufacturing happens in uh, Northern Ontario. Um, we of course assemble all the things together. Uh, Back in our own headquarters, and uh, we're using camera technology from uh, from BC. Actually, we're using um, uh, metal and uh, metal fabrication shops from all over the north. And um, it, so it's it's a partnership in the sense that we try to keep everything. Uh, you know, we if someone can do it better than us, we want them working with us. Uh, we want to get uh, you know. I don't want to uh, bend metal and weld things together. That's not my area of expertise. My area of expertise is the technology. So in that sense, yeah, it's a partnership of, of uh, to make these different necessary components come together. But the solo system is uh, something that we developed in-house um, using uh, these various components to create a system that mounts on any conveyor belt and does the the job of whip frag in an automated fashion, uh, giving you real time uh, data about your particles as they're passing down the conveyor belt. So is it uh, so? So it is whip frag just in a, con- a se- essentially conveyor form. Yeah, that, that's that's the form. easiest way to that, and that's a, that's how I describe it to anyone. We I start by telling them what whip frag does, and then okay, well, what is all this other stuff? It's whip frag, but mounted into a specialized uh, com- uh, compartment container that will be able to outlast the, uh, the various pressures that mines put on them, the dust, the, uh, the, the moisture, the whatever, the vibration, um, so that uh, it can keep on trucking and keep on uh, analyzing and providing valuable data to customers. So quickly on a conveyor system, what I, you said it can mount on any conveyor. So is it monitoring um, belt conditions? 
as well as materials, coloration, um, you know, any anomalies, items that yeah. might get lodged in? Like, is it covering the whole gamut? It's covering everything that's on the belt. Um, there, uh, we, we don't necessarily watch, uh, um, I mean, you probably could use our technology to, to, uh, to look at tears and things like that in the conveyor belt. That's not our, our first area though. It's about right, monitoring okay. what's passing down the stream. Um, and uh, yeah, so particle size, uh, particle shape, whether it's round, square, long, uh, long and thin, whatever the case may be. And like you said, coloration and, and uh, the volume of material, making sure that you're pushing through the right amount of material, because that's a huge part of uh, any process is uh, if you're underfeeding or overfeeding the next step in the process, mm. that'll change how efficient the process is. It'll change what's coming out on the other side. So it's about keeping those markers so that companies can see if things are drifting one way or the other and react to them before there's a problem. Mm -hmm. In traditionally, you can't do anything about it and you don't know what's happening until until there's a problem and everything comes to a halt. And that's millions of dollars of waste, uh, wasted time, wasted uh, power, wasted everything. And there's always the condition where anytime we have to stop the belt mm -hmm. or there's uh, something lodged somewhere, we have to send a guy in to to take care of that. And that's putting him or her in harm's way. And so it's another thing. It's the safety aspect of it. If we can stop these things from happening to begin with, uh, then we don't end up putting someone near these pinch points and pain points and uh, near these areas where something under immense pressure might explode and cause harm to someone. Is I was going to ask uh, just quickly too about the solo system. Is it... Um... Are there any environments where it, it wouldn't be fitting, maybe extremely cold, extremely hot, um, really dusty environments, anything like that? Like sort of what, where are, where does it sort of shine? Um, right. So we've, um, we've been all over the world. Uh, we've been uh, in the tundra. Uh, I've done some installations myself in the Northwest Territories and other uh, sub-zero climates. Um, and certainly in the Australian outback and uh, in uh, places in Africa where it gets much, much hotter than we, we experience in North Bay. So it's been a big part of our development process to, and, and it can be difficult at times to make sure that every single component, every part uh, fits into this temperature, pro this wide temperature range profile. So we, we don't end up with a system that's out there and fails because it's too hot, too cold. So actually uh, our technology is rated to do uh, down to minus 40, uh, which the those viewers who are uh, on the Fahrenheit side of things, it's the same thing, minus 40 Celsius, minus 40 Fahrenheit. It's, it's darn cold. Uh, so we can withstand that. And of course we can uh, reach temperatures of plus 80. If you get into plus 80, it's pretty hot. So uh, that, that's pretty much the limit on that side. So um, keeping everything within that range, uh, making sure we're only working with the best, most rugged componentry uh, so that no one, you know, gets one of our systems on site, starts running it. And then in the highest heat of the day, all of a sudden things go wrong. That's not something that uh, that we experience. So is there is there the, uh, I think I said last question on this, but I'm going to ask one more on it. Um, is there the machine learning side of it, has that evolved quite a bit over the last few years as obviously other technologies are every, the whole industry is sort of pushing forward. Has there sort of been an evolution and do you sort of have a first or front row seat to some of that? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, something that's been so important over the last few years is like remote management and rapid deployment of things, uh, you know, not spending very much time getting something uh, up and running. Um, a lot of this high technology stuff takes uh, calibration, takes uh, on-site technical visits and things like that. We wanted to eliminate as much of that as possible by using the latest and greatest of everything. I mean, uh, deep learning, uh, machine learning stuff like that's, we have that stuff in our cell phones now. Uh, it, it's everywhere. Um, you know, you can, uh, you can, you can map things and, and do object recognition and stuff like that using uh, free apps on, on a phone. So we want to take all that into uh, under, under our wing and, and utilize that. So absolutely. There's been, like you said, a huge evolution in that stuff. It's, it's taken quantum leaps forward over the last uh, few years. And that has allowed us to tap into that, that potential to, to harness that technology, to leverage it so that um, strengthening our, our edge detection algorithms and things like that, because that's the basis of what we do. 
like I said, we see the picture, we take, uh, we look at the material, we find the edges of it so we know what's a particle and what's not. With the machine learning that's out there now, uh, it's, and I'm sure you've interviewed lots of people who uh, are leveraging the same stuff. It's a matter of, uh, it's no longer a matter of finding one set of parameters that will satisfy anything that's coming through. It's a matter of showing the computer what you're looking for and the computer saying, all right, okay. And then you show it some more, you teach it, you build this, this deep learning model, this, uh, mm -hmm. this neural network. And all of a sudden it's, it, it can look at any picture, no matter if things change drastically, doesn't matter what I'm looking at. It can do the job that it's meant to do without interference. So I love how you're, machine... talk, sorry, you're talking about that as you're, as there's a robot dog dancing behind you. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, the, one of the highlights <laughs> of the PDAC and the CIM, yeah. of course. Yeah. 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 Awesome. yeah. It's, it's, uh, uh, I've, I've said it many times, it's pretty easy to sell your product when you can take it for a walk around the trade show. Floor. Yeah. No kidding. Hey, wow. Um, yeah. But yeah, so that, I mean, that must be also a, uh, uh, it, both there's a lot of opportunity, but there's also a lot of demand for customers from that. I mean, that must be a huge question of what exactly now is this? I mean, a lot of people know about whipware and they know about Whipfrag. But now that sort of staying up to date in that machine learning type part must be a huge sort of because you're so established, it must be a huge advantage to now have that layered in as well. Absolutely. And, and we do we have lots of customers who have been, uh, you know, we, we build our <laughs> we build our technology rugged enough that it, it lasts probably <laughs> longer than it should in the sense that um, we have we still have lots of customers uh, using a decades old technology of ours, they're happy mm. with it, they don't want it to change. But then they realize, hey, you know, this thing, uh, this thing's great, but look at everything that's out there now. And they come, right. they reach out to us, hey, like, what are you doing in this department? And we get to say, hey, yeah, come, I'll open the door for you. Come look at all this cool stuff we're doing. And yeah, so it, it, it is, it's a huge attraction point for us uh, that they know they can trust our technology and that we're, we're not, we didn't just park it and move on to something new. It's, uh, you know, we build technology to allow mines and milling processes and, and quarries to continuously improve their own process. But on our side, on the R&D side and on the development side, we, it's all about continuous improvement for us. Like we, we can never uh, park anything. Uh, as soon as something, some new uh, feature is launched, there's something else that that's coming out that we have to tap into to stay on top right. of it. I talked to a lot of other technology uh, builders and they say, you know, everyone loves how fast the technology is moving, except for the technologists there. Yeah. <laughs> because uh, once you master something, you better forget it and move on to the next thing that's coming out. Yeah. I mean, and it keeps you, it gives you a competitive edge if you can. Um, let's Absolutely. talk about actually the, uh, the, uh, the customers coming back if they came back from 10 years ago, they'd see a whole different business model because didn't you switch from my understanding, you switched from a uh, sort of a partnership licensing setup to an actual yep. subscription model. Yeah. So uh, we made, uh, we jumped in uh, to that with our latest version of Whipfrag, Whipfrag 4 um, to a full subscription model, annual subscription model. Um, or for those who don't like that style, they can do a, like a paper use, like an image credit style. So they buy a certain number of credits and spend them as they need to, depending on how much use they're going to get out of the software, what, what their application is, that kind of thing. And what's great about this on, on our side is that we have a really good idea of how many ongoing users we have. So whether you just dipped your toes in, cause you just wanted to see what it was all about. When you buy a permanent license, you've bought it we don't hear from you again. We don't know if you're using it or not. We right. only know, well, no news is good news typically. So we only know if you're upset or if there's something you want to see, some improvement you want, because that's when you get a hold right. of us. This way, and we don't, we don't track information or anything like that, but this way, because we have these ongoing subscriptions, we have a really good idea of what platforms are more popular, uh, whether, uh, how many Android users, how many iOS users, who's on Windows, what are, uh, you know, what kinds of aspects are they using? Do, do they want to pay per use or do they want to buy these uh, these annual subscriptions? And so that's been really great on our side. And of course, for the customer, it's great because it means that it gives them uh, a better window into updating and upgrading uh, their technology when we come out with the next thing. Right. Yeah. They don't have this useless license key anymore that, that doesn't do anything. They want the latest thing. Cool. Well, we can bridge them in very easily because right. they have a subscription model. So. 
is that, I mean, how has that, how has the response been to that? Has it opened a lot of doors? You know, we talk about barrier to entry. I mean, I, I certainly have went to go look at things and when I want to try it, you know, it's a 10 day trial period, but then it's a thousand dollars and you're like, oh, okay, well, it doesn't really give me enough time, but has that subscription model sort of given you just sort of taken away that barrier for some companies, maybe even smaller operators who want to try that's, it, but they're, yeah. they're not quite, you know, they're not as financed as a large corporation. That's right. That's the ticket. This is, we've always wanted our technology to be available to everyone, whether you are the multi-million dollar dyna, uh, diamond mining uh, company, or whether you are a freelance blaster who uh, just wants to have like a, a tool to audit your own work and show your customers that you're doing what they need the way they needed to be done um so yeah having subscription has made that so much easier because the the cost the barrier to entry is so much lower um you know instead of having like the permanent the permanent big ticket you know we don't know how long you're going to be using it for so we have to price it in order to you know make sure that it covers the expenses and the and the uh the product uh features now it's subscription based so it gives the user a, a, an easy jump in um we have like I said, more uh, more intermediate users or or uh, entry level users than we've ever had. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, there was definitely a little bit of surprise on the on the the more traditional company side. They were like, "Oh, uh, we're used to these uh, these permanent licenses. Why did you make this shift?" But once they hear the arguments and the the opportunities that come from that subscription model, they're right. easily convinced. And I mean. Everything on your computer, your whether you're using Microsoft Word or, or any all of these things, everything out there is subscription based. Now we wanted yeah. to join the fun, you know. Uh, we wanted to make it just as uh, as normal as any other app or service that you that everyone's using. Right. Is it? Um, what was I going to ask? Um, the oh, the hardware side of it though. It, it, so if you're going back to something like Solo now, are they buying that unit or is that part of the subscription? How does that part of it work? So that that's a one-time uh, purchase. So um, uh, and we also do uh, uh, equipment rental, of course, as well. Oh, okay. um, but so that's that's a purchase. So we don't. Uh, the way it essentially all works out is that. If you want to use the software as a standalone product, that's where the subscription comes in. If you're using one of our systems, the software WhipFrag is also the machine, the human machine interface, the HMI for that. Uh, it's the, the configuration software, if you will. So anyone who's using one of our systems doesn't have to worry about buying a subscription to WhipFrag because it's all built in. Oh, um, okay. Yeah, so it's for the standalone users who are just interested in the software. That's where the subscription kicks in, and that so gives is, you the unlocked features. Okay, so just to clarify, then, where is the if you're not using your hardware to get the data, the imaging, and that, then how are you using the software as a standalone? Are, where, are they getting the you're analyzing other data then? So you're analyzing basically you're analyzing either you're using the software to take a picture of material or take pictures of material or you're importing pictures you've already oh, taken like of into material. Your, like you're just using your phone or exactly console. yeah okay got it well, and, and that's the key ticket yeah. right because like i said we have these devices in our pockets uh they're uh, ready to roll everyone's got a cell phone or at least uh, everyone who's uh, down in the mine and communicating with their team members certainly has a device like that um so we just want to give you uh simple well a simple to use software simple to use that's the key yeah yeah simple to use software that's in your pocket instead of uh making you buy some big rig uh, component just to take a few pictures and analyze uh your uh, material grade right um on the hardware side the solo systems and the reflex system these are designed sp for specific applications like on a conveyor belt because right. um that way you, we can control the the lighting the uh, camera angle the the camera resolution and things like that to make sure we're getting good consistent data and it just runs through that same WhipFrag uh, model WhipFrag is the standalone software but it's also like I said the interface it's it's how you interact with your uh, solo device or or reflex device mm -hmm. um, and configure it and give it new instructions right no that's a good clarification um, so the uh... Okay, I want to talk before we wrap up. I want to talk about some of your new technologies. Obviously, drones are um, big. I don't want to say big. I don't want to say all the rage, <laughs> but they're they're very. I mean, 
the, the thought of doing what you can do in a drone with a helicopter, I know some companies are, I've still heard of some companies doing it. Um, but I mean, five years from now, no one's going to be, you know, taking imaging with a helicopter. I hope they aren't. Um, so can no. you talk about <laughs> some of those, uh, can you talk about some of the offerings now that you're on that, that drone and aerial side? Absolutely. So, um, what's really great about drones, you can imagine, uh, I mean, I've, I've, gone to do on-site analysis before uh, where I'm, I'm on the ground in a pit doing uh, material analysis with Whipfrag and I'm taking 200, 300 pictures of one area just to make sure I get a really good high resolution look at the data. Mm -hmm. Or I pop my case open, I fly the drone up, I fly over, fly one mission over top of the, uh, the blast or, or whatever it is, the stockpile. And uh, I bring that back. I open up my my computer or my uh, my tablet, and I input the information. All I have to do now with Whipfrag Four is take those pictures that I got on the drone in that one flight mission, that one uh, twenty minute flight mission. I uh, plug them into Whipfrag, and Whipfrag builds an ortho mosaic for me. Uh, ortho mosaic image being a, a ortho top down pictures mosaic of course, uh, stitching together multiple things. So basically an ortho mosaic is a, a picture made up of a bunch of smaller pictures. So Whipfrag will actually build that ortho mosaic for me, meaning I don't have to use a bunch of other software to make that happen. And then it will in turn take that picture, analyze it and give me a very large macro view and micro view of my material uh, grade, whether I'm on spec or off spec, whether it was a good blast or a bad blast. So we've spent a lot of time to make it so that you don't have to use four or five different softwares just to get one piece of information uh, and then move on and rinse and repeat that process over and over again. Now it's a one-stop shop. Um, and that's one of the big things. So using our geographic information system or GIS for short, we're able to have uh, a world map where no matter where you're taking your images from, how many processes you're in charge of, how many different areas you're monitoring, you can look at this all uh, from a, a kind of a map perspective and geographically say, okay, so over here we have, whether it's within one pit, over here we have bad fragmentation, we have good fragmentation over here. We always get into the weeds or the mud on this side, so we got to be careful about blasting further in that direction, that kind of thing. This is like, uh, super useful for uh, planning, planning your next move uh, in any case, uh, whether it's, like I said, whether it's a, a quarry blasting operation uh, or whether it's underground somewhere, yeah. it adds to the tools that are already available to all these uh, technicians and, and experts. Uh, it just gives them another point of information and one-stop shop, which is key. Uh, no one wants to have to, uh, you'd rather bring a one, one multi-tool than uh, five different uh, small tools mm -hmm. in, in a kit. You mentioned going on um, on site a couple times. Now, is Whipper actually uh, providing the service as well? Like, are they are you you going out there with drones, or are you partnering up with you know someone out of a, another province? Says, hey, I wanna I wanna provide this service to people. Um, are you creating those partnerships? It's typically for uh, like an opportunity to train or or display what the technology can do. They're, there's every once in a while we encounter someone who's unsure or they're not convinced and they just want something a little more practical of a demonstration. Mm -hmm. If we can do it, if it's within our, uh, our, uh, our, our zone, so to speak, to be able to travel there or, or whatever the case may be, then yeah, we'd love to do on-site demonstrations and things like that. Uh, of course, getting on site in some cases is really difficult. So that's why it's also nice that we have all these virtual tools available to us to uh, show what the technology does. So we do on sites. We uh, we prefer, though, of course, to to empower the end user to mm -hmm. gather their own information. That's one of the big focuses of the latest developments of the software has been right D DIY. Um, because it's difficult to move people sometimes and it's difficult to- uh, As we've learned the last couple of years. <laughs> that's right. And, and, and to, to stop a process, like there's a lot of vectors. There's a lot of things going on at any yeah. uh, mining process, milling process, quarrying process. There's so many things going on and downtime equals dollars. So if you stop the process because you want to do a quick little training session, someone's tapping their foot somewhere being like, hey, right. we're losing money or whatever the case may be. Hey, I yeah. want to get that next blast going. So um, 
that's why it's easier rather than trying to schedule and line up all these vectors so that it all works out without causing too much efficiency loss. It's easier to empower the user to say, okay, I know how to do this. I know when the best time to do it is. Uh, so I will, uh, you know, whether it's the middle of the night or something like this, I'll be able to launch my, uh, my flight mission of my drone, or I'll be able to go down and inspect that area and take some mm -hmm. pictures, that kind of thing. Um, so we don't do on sites super often. Uh, I like traveling. It's nice. Uh, but, um, I also don't want to get in anyone's way. So like I said, we, we want you to get the information and that's how everything's designed towards. Okay, I just don't want a clarification on that. Those who the end user now is that always the mine operator or the site operator, or will that sometimes be like a, th a third party that I, I decide I want to get into the business of of like do you are you collaborating in that sense, or is this oh yeah absolutely the drone flyer We're, yeah yeah so we are no we absolutely we we work with a lot of blasting groups that they they want to have a uh, like an outside perspective to show that they are doing their job right. and doing yeah, it well. Okay. Um, so blasters, uh, it's not always, it's not always the actual site that hires us, uh, on or uses our technology. Um, it's often blasting consultants, like I said, um, mm -hmm. or, um, we have a lot of people who are just, uh, they're looking to develop, uh, maybe smart conveyors and stuff like that. So they, right. they, in order to prove that their te technology is working, they buy one of our conveyor belt systems in order to say, yeah, look, it's, it's, uh, it's able to respond to all this different stimulus. And, and uh, so it helps them prove their own technology, which is really cool too. And we have uh, opportunities. There's, there's so much underground exploration, like mm -hmm. robotic automated exploration going on. Um, so we have lots of opportunities here where um, someone's building a, a device that, that autonomously goes underground and inspects certain areas, keeping people right. far away from harm. And they also want to grab some fragmentation analysis data while they're down there. Well, they basically take WIPFRAG and put it on their device or take our technology and put it, integrate it with their device. And there you go. They have so a, that'd be another like a one reflex. Shot. That'd be like a re the reflex would be the application for something like that. Do I have that right? Yeah. Or Kind of, sort of. The reflex is a vehicle analysis system, and, and it's a bit of an ambiguous name there, but essentially what it does is it analyzes material being carried by vehicles. Oh, it's oh see. Okay. really not much different than the solo. It's just the whether we're looking at a moving conveyor belt or chute, or whether we're further away from the, uh, the uh, target and looking at uh, something being dumped out of the back of a truck or being hauled by a scoop tram or something like this. Right. So uh, essentially a separate lens to collect the same data. Separate lens, separate uh, sensor uh, kind of infrastructure to make sure that it can detect when when materials there and when it's not. Yeah. So just, just to clarify that when, when it's when you that example you use of something that's like autonomous or something that's going underneath ground to analyze then what. So WIPFRAG is obviously analyzing what applicate what what uh, what physical things like device. The the yeah, on. so things like the robot dog that we, we just saw a little right. bit ago, um, that's a, that particular device is a mine rescue device, but, and, and I'm not saying they're using our technology, but those kinds of uh, robotic uh, devices, drones, uh, underground drones are becoming a really big thing, super cool stuff. Okay. Um, so they're, they're saying, it's one of those things where, hey, I'm already down here. How much data can I gather while I'm down here? There's more than one thing I can do while I'm here. Well, Hey, well, Whipware can help us with that. Um, so those are the kinds of partnerships we're uh, we're getting into and we're exploring. Uh, it's about leveraging this technology in as many ways as you can. It's it's very exciting. It's you know it's good. I I and it's because all all the con the first conversation we had with with Tom was I mean that was very first show. I think that we'd only done maybe two shows prior to that or something. It was very and then the second one was celebrating um, uh, your. 30, 30, 50, yeah, 30, 30, 30 years, years, 30 years. Yeah. yeah celebrating yeah. the 30 years. Um, and so this one has been much, much more like right down the middle of that technical aspect. So I'm glad we got to do it. And of course, fitting that, you know, to do it at the PDAC is exciting as well. So, Andrew, yeah, thanks for coming on. I, I certainly hope this is not the last time we get to do an interview. Uh, it was great to have you. It was great to be here. Thanks very much. Thank you, sir. Okay, everyone. That is uh, the, the, end of the first episode for day two at PDAC. We'll have plenty more coming at you. Thanks for watching. We will see you on the next episode of Mining Now.